Astronaut by Alan Harbinson. When they had finished, he turned on his back and lay there quietly and stared with flat eyes at the ceiling. It was warm in the room, there was no sun outside, and not for years had they heard the sound of birds. She was restless. Her blonde hair tumbled across the white pillow, coiled slowly around one nervous finger. Through the high open window, he had a clear view of the moon pale and remote in its star-spangled velvet isolation. He thought of the grey towers raised in the desert, reflecting this same light which shone on him. It was almost as if nothing ever changed. Can I have a cigarette? It's bad for your lungs. <sighs> I want no jargon. I want a cigarette. Let me roll a tranquilizer instead. No. It's better for you. No. If you insist. Thank you. Not at all. Such politeness. <laughs> Believe it or not, we are lovers. Yes. How exciting it is. Don't be mean. I'm not. You are. I don't mean to be. I just sometimes wonder why we bother. I mean, nothing ever really goes on between us. Nothing, nothing, nothing. We eat, drink, smoke, make love. Sit staring, hypnotized at the video. And if things become a bit too dull, we lie back and make love again. It's harmless. It's therapeutic. It's time passing. But nothing ever really happens between us. Nothing, nothing, nothing. And I wonder why we bothered in the first place. Well, why did we? You were so handsome. So handsome and so very cool. That's what really made me fall for you. Your incredible cool, that superb abstraction. You had it in your eyes, as all your kind have it. And it seemed so mysterious at the time. Now I hate it, because it never ends. Not even when we make love. You don't see. You don't hear, you don't touch. Sometimes I think you're a dead man. Please. It's true. It's melodramatic. It's still true. Perhaps. What do they do to you? What is it that they do to all of you? 
So healthy, so intelligent, so clear-eyed, so dedicated, so numb. Are you some new breed of human being? Possibly. But how could I tell you? But he didn't reply. He just said it in his mind, and he kept his eyes closed, looking in. The question was quite academic to him. What did she know of the steel towers in the wilderness, of the infinite silence and beauty? This lady beside him was very lovely, but possessed of some minor neurosis. They were both human beings of flesh and blood, but their differences were quite acute. Education was surely the great divider. I've been trained in San Antonio, in St. Louis, in New Mexico, and in the Dust Bowl Museum of Houston, Texas. Physics, astrophysics, astronomy, biology, geology, technology. I know how to stay alive in deserts and jungles, in hot lava regions and in sub-zero temperatures. I know how to stay sane in the vacuum. It was very possible that this latter ability was his handicap when dealing with the lady. They had drained him of fear and panic and despondency. He would therefore function in the void. But how he would then fare with his fellow humans was something they just hadn't considered. Well, why don't you answer me? He looks at her. But what does he see? The centrifuge. That huge steel spider in the dark round room in the pit with the capsule and the sensors. Oh, I'm a long-standing expert, and I do five minutes every day at 15 G. That's to keep in shape. He likes it. My heart pounds, my gums explode, my eyes bulge out of their sockets. But I've done it so much, it's almost become a, a physical pleasure. And once out there in the void on that longest of journeys, I'll miss it. What can I say? Oh, God. Can we not even talk anymore? Let's make love. He spirals around to see the heaving, pale line containing oxygen and energy, the umbilical cord that ties him to the mother's ship. It isn't too large, a shambles of bare metallic necessity, glaring white in the surrounding depthless night. He floats there on the end of the curved cord, on this his sixth isolation exercise. Above him is the hazed, blue-white globe of the Earth. Beneath him is the colonized moon. And on all sides, in those spaces now devoid of dimension, are the numberless galaxies and their stars. He takes a deep breath. Radio contact is broken. And he is left alone for 48 hours. The most isolated living thing in the universe. A human star. A mere smudge of sperm in the womb. Touch me. I'm trying. Touch me. I'm trying. Touch me. It was a new way of life. An old way of life. The only way of life. What do they do to you? After a while, you didn't know just what was where or when. Didn't know whether you were on the moon or back on Earth or floating in space or in the simulator. Perhaps most of all, it was like that in the simulator, where you had to invent games to stay sane. I always tried to go back to when I was 16 years of age. And it worked fine for the first few days. But then I began to see the holes at my feet and the huge rats coming out to get at me. Let me out! Let me out! Let me out! Let me out! I was released after that. They clapped my back, told me I'd set a sort of a record. 
My resistance to isolation was unusually high. But then they put me in a tank of water where I couldn't see nor hear nor feel. And that was death. That was pure imprisonment in the mind. And after a while, I couldn't think at all. I was a cabbage. Strangely enough, when they let him out this time, they told him he was excellent material. The moon, they said, was just a fancy playing ground for the scientists, the geologists, the astronomers, the doctors, and all those rich cardiac cases. And for the Pentagon, it was merely a springboard. The ultimate target was Alpha Centauri. The intermediary exploration flight would be Mars. That was where they wanted to send him, because only he and a couple more like him could tolerate the two years of isolation. And at times, I even like the simulator. You don't feel anything. I'm sorry. Oh, God. <sighs> Why do we bother? How did it start? I met him at the Palms in the NASA motel on the eve of one of those damned launchings. He was sitting by the swimming pool and I was excited by his remoteness. But I didn't realize just how deep it went. That was in New Mexico, and now we're in Florida, and he tells me this is our last night. Just like that. Real cool. Honey, I've got to leave, and I don't know when I'll be back, but it'll be at least a couple of years. Just like that. Real cool. And then makes love in that very remote way, hoping I won't notice he's not there. God, but I hate him for what he is, or for what they've turned him into. He must be going up there again. I am. I am going. I'm going up there. I'm going up there where I belong. This explorer, this Superman, this modern Columbus, this efficient, unemotional machine. And now, I know how much he really needs it. Perhaps you'll become a star. Pardon? I said, perhaps you'll become a star. Are you being sarcastic? Yes. Abstractionists always changed with the scenery. Once there were philosophers, then there were poets, then came the astronauts. A new breed of man, they lived in those voids of silence and infinite night. What it might do to their minds was a question beyond routine comprehension. But she sensed that it might not be pleasant, that perhaps her own ignorance was also selfishness. She had tried to understand, but she had failed. Damn that moon, and the stars, and the vacuum, and the breed of man they need to explore it. What do they find up there? I have to go. Yes. You must hate me. <coughs> Men do occasionally become stars. It was as easy as that, though people would never believe it. Floating out there in the measureless black pit of space, hearing nothing except what came through the earphones, which was a scream, almost bestial, beyond any known horror, as Zimmerman ripped his suit on the edge of the bolt and his blood started to boil and his skin began to rise. And I turned and looked and saw something like a white sheet swelling up in the air. And then it 
was a balloon with a smashed glass face, and the scream stopped dead. And I chopped the line and let him go, and he was floating away into orbit. This was on the dark, far side of the moon, just out of the gravitational pull. And he took the ship back and left that thing out there to circle around for centuries. Sooner or later, it might fall into the sun. But at the moment, it just occasionally catches the sun's light and reflects it down on us. Like a star. When you're gone, I'm getting out of here. I can't take it anymore, this life in a menagerie. We're like hermits sealed off from the earth. God, Florida. When I think of it, I want to go mad. It used to be a tropical paradise, but we've killed it all off with our new dreams. The trees are extinct, the grass is synthetic fiber, and the only animal left is the snake. They say artificial sunshine is healthier than the real thing, and that's why no one ever goes near the beaches. Are you proud of being a part of it? It's the only thing I know. Then God help you. You're part of it, too. You just don't realize it. I refuse. You can't refuse. If it's not you, it'll be the children you have later. It's neither good nor bad, right nor wrong. It's a direction, a movement, pure and simple. Once there were canoes, then wagons on the prairies. Now it's the spaceships to the stars. You can't refuse. I can't refuse. We can't refuse. It's a movement, and it cannot be stopped. I feel neither proud nor ashamed. I'll drive you back. Thank you. I know what you think, and you're wrong. What do I think? That I don't feel enough. Yes. You're wrong. I think I'm right. You don't understand. I feel, but I've got to keep control. The journey to come is at least one year each way. It's not a trip for someone too emotional. I want to think of you, to reach you as much as I can. But I must think more of the other things. I'm incidental. Not quite. Above is the night sky, the infinite dark. Nearby is an ocean, polluted. The launching pad for the final flight is floating out there in steel-webbed silence, a monolith caressing the moon. Not far away in the wastelands of Cape Kennedy is the pad for the intermediary flight. He thinks of the grey towers raised in the desert, reflecting this same light which shines on him. It's almost as if nothing ever changes. The trees are extinct. The grass is synthetic fiber, and the only animal left is the snake. We are thrusting from our loins into the universe. And for everything that lives, there must be death. What do you find up there? Just space, nothing else. Are you still there, Zimmerman? Circling around in that penultimate void? in the awesome majesty of your flight. He screamed as his blood boiled and his flesh began to rise. And then he was a huge balloon disappearing. <coughs> Clinging to the metallic white spider of the mother ship, imprisoned behind the star reflecting perspex, I watched him spiraling out into the void. There was a moment when I almost wanted to scream along with him but I noticed that I'd chopped the line anyway. That was good. I had not failed my training, and the thought of it calmed me immediately. No, he was not likely to forget what was up there. Listen to me. What? Without trying to, without wanting to, uh, I think I, I love you. It's a movement and it cannot be stopped. I feel neither proud nor ashamed. Did you hear me? Yes. No answer? I'm sorry. I lied anyway. Why do I lie? 
I don't know. No, you wouldn't. You don't live here anymore. Oh, God, that moon. How I hate that moon. Yes, I know what you think. You think I'll die lonely and denying the inevitable, while my children inhabit the valley of eternal light. Well, if it's true, then truth be damned. I'm a feminine fool and want to be. I will not accept the necessity of that cinder. here. This concentration camp. Your home. Yes. Damn it. I shiver just to look at them. The towers, I mean. The launching towers. I know. But people get used to them. So cold and bleak. Like forgotten oil derricks. And each one sent a man out there. Yes. We think they're the new cathedrals. My God. The new cathedrals. She bit her lower lip closed her eyes and leaned her forehead gently on the steering wheel. She thought of this man she had met by a heated swimming pool in a NASA motel in New Mexico. For everything that lives, there must be death. Pardon? What difference between this car and a wagon in the wilderness and a spaceship heading out for Alpha Centauri? It's neither good nor bad, right nor wrong. It's only people on the move, going somewhere. I said it before, and I stand by it. For everything that lives, there must be death. The green grass of Earth, us, and you and I, we give way to whatever follows us. We're manure for the fields of the future. Do you understand? It cannot be prevented. It just is. And like me, you're inexorably part of it. That's horrible. There's beauty and horror everywhere. I'm going. I lied about lying. I do love you. Goodbye. There are windowless black hangars and skeletal towers. There's a star-flecked, dark wilderness above. He walks lightly, confidently, and flashes his identity card, and is admitted through the secretive steel gates. Here he stops and looks up. The sky is superb. If it stays that way, the takeoff should be fine. centrifuge and the x-ray and the electroencephalogram and the eyes and the ears and the nose and the blood and the three days of dieting and briefing then sensors on the chest on the stomach on the nostrils then the helmet and the oxygen carrying suit they bury you in it like an egyptian mummy and they place you in the cool tomb of the ship fierce flame and bedlam and melting metal and the ship thrusts up to the womb of the universe, to the spiral of the infinite, to the unknown possibilities of the future. Norman Mailer, 1970 AD, from pieces of manuscript discovered in Earth excavation. A century devoted to the rationality of technique was also a century so irrational as to open in every mind the real possibility of global destruction. It was the first century in history which presented to sane and sober minds the fair chance that the century might not reach the end of its span. It was a world half convinced of the future death of our species, yet half aroused by the apocalyptic notion that an exceptional future still lay before us. So it was a century which moved with the most magnificent display of power into directions it could not comprehend. Yes, astronauts have learned not only to live with opposites, but it was conceivable that the contradictions in their nature were so located in the very impetus of the age that their personality might begin to speak, for better or worse, of some new psychological constitution to man.
Astronaut was written by Alan Harbinson. Blaine Fairman was the astronaut. Liza Ross, the woman. John Rowe, the narrator. Production was by Jerry Jones. <laughs>